Yeah. I'm, yeah. Thank you. Good evening, friends on Facebook, and I thank you, the group uh, admin of Adventures, Ad Adventures in Archaeology, and other Facebook friends. And I'm really glad to get an opportunity to speak, talk on the subject understanding epigraphical studies in its broad perspective. And uh, why I chose the general subject is there are uh, friends, you know, who come from dis different disciplines and they may be interested to know what epigraphy means, what prospects it has, what aim and scope. And then I chose this uh, very general topic to address, give a talk on this subject. And, uh, and I mostly, you know, I should thank uh, uh, Mr. Uday Kumar, uh, who constantly did a lot of work as far as the uh, stone inscription from Bangalore. And uh, he created, generated a lot of interest among the public as well as students. I think uh, that's a very good beginning for Bangaloreans. And he has brought uh, many new inscriptions and already published ones also. So uh, and as far as though he's confined to Bangalore, he has done a very good thing. So I thought I should uh, thank him uh, being a very good, I mean, I have been following very constantly his uh, Facebook postings and really he has done a very good job. And uh, when I interacted with a lot of time with the students and the public, um, there is something, you know, much more to be known about the antiquity of writing system in the world civilization, as well as in the Indian concept. So epigraphy, in not, instead of coming directly to the subject, I thought uh, I should say a little on the antiquity of world civilization. When did the writing start? And uh, what's the definition of writing? These are very, very important thing. And uh, David Diringer has beautifully defined writing is a graphic representation of language. And you know, mankind has been in existence last several millions of years. And the writing came at a much, much later phase in the later period. So we have to understand, and he has observed in the humanities, the study of writing, the art of writing has not been understood properly. So we are coming directly to our epigraphical material or studies. So it's very much important to know this uh, antiquity of writing, the art of writing, how it emerged and how it influenced in different parts of the continent and how it grew. It's a very, very important thing. So mankind has been existence in, since many years and he has also observed more than the discovery of the fire wheel, the art of writing is very, very unique, important discovery that mankind has given. Just we can well imagine in the absence of writing, how would have been we have paralyzed the whole thing, no communication, what the world has shrunk in a small thing, you know, it's because of the system of writing, conveying our feelings, conveying our thoughts to writing and many things. So this, uh, the art of the writing is a very, very important thing that I think uh, we should inculcate. We should uh, give much importance to understand in the entire scenario, uh, what is the art of writing? And you know, language has been existent since many years. Many groups in different continents, evolved, all world over, they spoke different languages, but they could not record it because in the absence of a script. So script came much later. A language was in existence since many, many years. So what their language spoke, whatever languages we have, since we have a script to know, we understand this is written. So in the language was there much, much earlier and the script came much later. And uh, this is a very important thing. And uh, as an archaeologist, uh, we should know the upper Paleolithic period, which is roughly defined around 20,000 BC. That's the beginning, they say. Man started his efforts to make something expressive, though in the beginning it may be some circles, 
symbols, some petroglyphs. But that is the beginning we see. So this is the beginning we have to understand to know subsequently how the system of writing started. So David Derenger in his book, both on the alphabets and the writing has beautifully defined and uh, dealt with various scripts, the languages that prevailed in the past. And uh, to understand that, you know, there are three, four stages here we have to note. One is the pictography or the picture writing. It all made, you know, how a man could convey his, uh, you want to convey. So it all started with pictography and archaeologists may see we have Bembatka and so many things. So the expression, what we see, you know, through pictures, he tried to convey his thoughts or his, uh, by drawing a hunting scene or a deer or anything, he conveyed through pictograph. That is the first stage in the uh, development of uh, writing. And the second is uh, ideographic writing that we want to put ideas as well as uh, that is uh, another uh, system in the development and the phonetic. And then he started giving uh, each value to a phonetic sound symbol. So that is phonetic. And the last stage is alphabetic. That is what we have at present is alphabetic stage. So these are the four stages one should try to know in the evolution of uh, art of writing. So there is a growth in difference, uh, this one, and very, very important script that prevailed in the fourth millennium BC, the hieroglyphic and cuneiform uh, of writing, which prevailed in Egypt, Mesopotamia, Crete, and so many world civilization to understand in depth its development or the evolution, one has to read the book uh, written by David Derringer. He has wonderfully dealt. And now, you know, uh, coming to uh, the another major breakthrough is the Rosetta Stone inscription. Maybe many scholars may be wondering why we are the Indus script still remains a puzzle, enigmatic script, because we don't have a biscriptal bilingual inscription. So that's why even now scholars are making effort and there is a lot of efforts being made to understand or to decipher and unanimously it has not been accepted, though many uh, interpretations or decipherment are coming through. So in this slide, you know, I suggest many groups, you know, who want to do something connected with Indus scripts, they should try to know the scripts that prevailed in uh, earlier uh, period, uh, that is uh, the world civilization, what are the scripts that prevailed, how it might have influenced. Um, even Dani observes, we cannot see in the script in isolation. To understand that, you know, we should try to know the other script that prevailed, contemporary or even early script. So that's very, very important. I would like to give a suggestion to those who are uh, making some efforts. In the recent years, you know, some very good efforts are made to uh, unravel the uh, enigmatic uh, in the script. So that's going on. But uh, still, a final uh, decipherment is yet pending. And another thing, you know, I would like to come on to the antiquity of writing in India. This is also equally important. First, we have to understand in the entire context, the world civilization, how it was there. And then coming to our regular epigraphical records, written records, we should try to know what is the antiquity of writing uh, in Indian context. So. For us, the benchmark or the beginning is the Indus seals, you know, large uh, excavations conducted, it will come, has come out with large number of seals and ceilings. So they form the beginning of the written record, though it may be small, cryptic, small uh, seals, but they form in a way the first expressions by of writing so roughly we can place it around 2500 BC, the, uh, the upper, the made the, the loyal mark for the Harappan seals. And then, uh, of course, they say till 1750 I mean, uh, BC, uh, we have large number of seals and ceilings 
uh, from different parts of India. So later, after that, till third century BC, we don't have any written records. Those scholars, you know, in the recent years, they have tried to discover, they have found some more inscriptions, which they try to take it little early phase. But by and large, you know, we don't have a large uh, number of uh, inscriptions uh, to that. So there is a huge time gap from 1750 BC to 300 BC. Though we have some more early coins, like Shreni and other coins have come. Uh, so we can slightly push that. So there are uh, two uh, ways, you know, one is the archaeological sources, another is the literary sources. Uh, there are, uh, you know, Anuradha Pura excavations much, much earlier, even recent in Indian context also, uh, they have found some more uh, inscriptions which uh, can be taken. Even in the megalithic period, we have potsherds and other with some graffiti marks. So they take it to uh, 10,000 BC or something like that. So for all purposes, you know, there is a huge gap unless the spade of the archaeologist comes through some more inscription we can't make out. There is a huge gap in that. And uh, many more archaeological excavations are there that forms one of the source. And another is literary sources, the Brahminical sources like Vedas, Upanishads, and others, you know, they speak of some of the words like Akshara, Meter, Chandas, like that, you know. So that clearly shows there existed a system of writing. But only thing, since the oral tradition was very powerful, it was going on, they never committed in the writing. Perhaps another thing, they might have written in a perishable material like uh, birch leaf or other leaf, uh, which might not have lasted for longer duration till they chose a permanent material like stone or copper plate. Even there are instances uh, where DC Sarkar and Raja, uh, in earlier cases, you know, they wrote on a palm leaf, some sale deed or something, Later, they transferred the whole thing on a copper plate or stone. So the thing is that there may be some earlier inscriptions, I mean, uh, written records, written on perishable material that has not come down to us. And then uh, the Vedas, Upanishads. So they speak of uh, some of the thing. And the Jaina also works, you know, they speak of some of the words connected with the existence of some system of writing and the Buddhist work also. Lalita Vistara is a Buddhist work, which of course, much, much later period, which mentions, which gives a list of all the uh, scripts that prevailed, uh, including the 64, uh, he has listed 64 uh, forms of writing, starting from Brahmi to uh, different uh, ways of writing. So for us, the written records, you know, starts around uh, third century BC. Apart from a huge corpus of Ashokan rock edicts, we have um, many early Brahmi inscriptions from Piprava, Saugara, and uh, other places, and uh, third century BC. But unfortunately, we don't have a large number of inscriptions from that period. So practically for us, the beginning of our written history starts from 3rd century BC, maybe a few, maybe earlier years. And um, necessarily when we see, you know, this is the beginning of the epigraphical studies we can make. And uh, Dani has pointed out the establishment of the Asiatic Society of Bengal in the year 1788 is a very important landmark event as far as bringing together a lot of Indological studies, not only inscriptions, mythology, so many things, you know, they were published periodically in the journals which they brought out from the uh, Society of Asiatic Society of Bengal, which was established in the year 1789. It galvanized the study to a great extent. So, Epigraphy, you know, is a disciplinary subject. One should know 
mythology and uh, ephemeris and then the uh, scripts and languages. There are persons who are great pandits, you know, in Sanskrit, but they cannot decipher. But an epigraphist, he may be in a position to de decipher, but unless he has a firm, good knowledge of Sanskrit or the language in which it is written, we cannot decipher. So it's just like a face of a true coin where the knowledge of script as well as language is equally important to deal any inscribed material, maybe later period, even earlier phase. So the establishment of Asia is a very, very important landmark, which is there. And uh, Doni has categorized this thing in three different stages. That is, uh, in the later part of the 17th century, a lot of inscriptions that were found in the entire Indian subcontinent. Scholars were interested. They made in-situ study and made intensive epigraphical surveys and copied large number of inscriptions from different parts of India, include, including, I would like to say in a greater Indian context, those inscriptions that are found in Ceylon, Burma, Myanmar, and other SAR countries. And in the same breath, I would like to add, even they did the study inscriptions that are found in Southeast Asia, you know, where along with the trade and other thing, you know, scripts and language also traveled and had occasion to visit many of the countries and saw how beautifully they have uh, written inscription around fifth and sixth century, along with our Hindu tradition and culture, even the script that, you know, traveled beyond India. So in the greater Indian context, Brihad Bharata, we have to see how the script, you know, they travel and they are written in pure, beautiful Sanskrit that we can see once we examine those inscriptions that were reported from Cambodia, Sumatra, Java, Bali, and other places. So this is the first stage where large number of inscriptions were copied from different parts of India and that is then. And the second stage is the preparation of calligraphical charts. This is a very, very important aspect. You know, scholars examined. I'm not going to the history of the calligraphers and other things. That's a very another area. So, but the second stage is preparation of charts. Bueller's, later Shivaramurthy, Dani, many, many. You know, they did the prepared charts. And... Uh, they made us to understand a lot of uh, inscriptions by making us, providing us the key. Even we have to time, you know, remember the contribution of James Princip, the father of Indian epigraphy. And he prepared chart, they keep, uh, kept the key before us for Brahmi scripts. So this is the second stage, the calligraphical charts. And when you see, you know, largely from 3rd century BC to the 12th century common era, we have charts uh, tracing the evolution of particularly Brahmi, that we have the charts. And uh, the another very important uh, stage is bringing out epigraphical publications. This is, this is the third stage. The first stage is copying larger number of inscriptions that are found in the entire subcontinent. And the second stage is preparation of calligraphical charts. And the third of all, in the bringing out epigraphical publications, most of you are aware, Epigraphia Indica, Corpus Inscription Indicarum, South Indian Inscriptions Volume, and many, many publications, you know, even the State Archaeology, Directorate of Archaeology and Museum Karnataka, MR, Mysore Archaeological Reports, Epigraphia, Karnataka. So it's uh, a collective work from the state and central. So we have a huge corpus of inscriptions we have before us. So the not only this, India, even we see we have earlier issues of Epigraphia, Burmica. In Myanmar also they brought, they brought out those inscriptions that were there. And Epigraphia, Zailanica, that is from Again, from Sri Lanka, we have 
So, and uh, again, uh, many of the inscriptions, you know, that were reported from Cambodia and all, they were published uh, and they brought it uh, to the scholarly world. This is a very, very important uh, uh, contribution. So, what is epigraphy? It means it's a Greek word. Epi means on or upon, and graph, graphy to write. It's a Greek word um, made of two words, epigraph, to write upon. So, largely on a harder material you find on lithic or copper plates, and in the extended sense, even it is included the Painted inscriptions also, though few, uh, that also we call it inscriptions. So we have in extension sense, we have taken, when you see paintings in Ajanta Lora, we have some small paintings, you know, written to denote in early characters. So painted inscriptions also form in the extended sense. About the language and script, this is a uh, very, very important aspect one has to look into it. I told, you know, a command. Epigraphy is a multidisciplinary subject. One has to know the language and the script. And two major scripts that prevail. One is Brahmi, where we have large number of inscriptions, and Kharoshti. And during Ashokan period, so we have inscriptions, his own edicts written in Greek and Aramic and the uh, Karoshti inscription rocket is from reported from Mansehara and uh, other place. So Karoshti also formed one of the major scripts that were there. Unfortunately, it didn't uh, continue in Indian subcontinent after the third or uh, fourth century. It went to Central India, I mean Central Asia and many other countries later. So Brahmi become a very, very popular script. So it has undergone a large number of, I mean, evolutionary process from, uh, though very few changes are to be seen from third century BC to the end of uh, first century BC. But later with the advent of the Shaka Kshatrapas and they brought a new technique in the art of writing, the pen technique, there started the, uh, there is a paradigm shift you can see in the way of writing. And uh, we have, from then, we have large number of uh, the evolutionary process taking place each century. So that is paleography. What is paleo? That is ancient writing. We have paleobotany, paleozoology, like that. Paleo means early ancient. So paleography is one, every century wise, you know, the script that has undergone change is studied and how made charts for us to understand so that is uh, the thing. So scripts uh, for a longer period, you know, from third century BC up to the Gupta, we call it uh, early Brahmi and late Brahmi, that is from third century BC to sixth century common era, or end of fifth century, we have this uh, late Brahmi characters. And uh, similar period, we have two more uh, important scripts, you know, box-headed characters and nail-headed characters, especially you might have seen the Vakatakas, the contemporaries of the Guptas, they created a way of writing that has uniquely, you see in the copper plates, are very few stone also, the box-headed characters and the nail-headed characters that also prevailed even little later from 5th century to 7th century, nail-headed characters. And the further in its development process, we see the development of Siddhamatrika characters from Gupta, post Gupta period, that is from 6th century common era to 8th century, we have a script called Siddhamatrika or Kutila. It is further evolution, we see. And that is a period, again, we have shell characters, Shankulipi. You might have heard many of the scholars, the immense contribution made by Dr. Professor. B.N. Mukherjee in this realm is very, very important. He documented, he made us understand how to decipher a shell character inscription. But unfortunately, uh, his own student couldn't, I mean, could not carry on whatever research he did to decipher. They have been documented, but still 
decipherment is uh, required. So mm -hmm. this is shell characters. And uh, further we have the early Nagari coming through in 8th century, end of 8th century. And uh, the similar, we have the Sharada script is equally very, very important. And the Proto-Bengali like that. We have many scripts coming. And the palligraphers, I told, you know, they started the charts and uh, making note of it from 3rd century BC to uh, 12th century common era. So later, the evolutionary process uh, was not much. So later, much, much later, when the printing media came, there is no much evolution. So that's why either in the Vijayanagar period or late, uh, we have uh, inscriptions written in Nandinagari. Of course, even Nagari, we see early Nagari, Nagari and Devanagari, which spreads from uh, 8th century, end of 8th century to uh, 12th or 13th century. So, and uh, coming to the language, you know, earlier, you know, Prakrit was a very, very popular lingua franca. That's what Ashoka also in all his edicts, even his early, even other early inscriptions uh, preferred uh, from Prakrit. So that was predominantly a very, very important language. And you find all earlier inscriptions. So roughly, we can say from 3rd century BC to the 3rd century AD, in the North Indian context, Prakrit continued as a very, very important language, though we have very few inscriptions. And in South Indian context, it continued for another century. Maybe it lasted till the 4th century, where we have early Pallava records written in uh, Prakrit language. So Prakrit was there and there are some intermediary period, end of first century BC and the beginning of uh, first century Kamadara. There are inscriptions written in Prakrit having Sanskrit influence. There are Sanskrit inscriptions with Prakrit influence. This is uh, zonal that changes you, know, you find when you inscriptions examine like uh, Heliodorus and many. So uh, element of Prakritism is seen that lasted in two uh, centuries or so. It's uh, uh, very, very important. And uh, Sanskrit, you know, continued as a very, very important language with the emergence of the Guptas. Though we have earlier also a large number of inscription, and I would like to refer to the Rudradaman inscription is very, very important as uh, which is dated to uh, 150 common era is very, very important uh, inscription. So Sanskrit continued as a very important uh, uh, lingua franca. I, I became a pan-Indian language, I should say, the post-Gupta period. Even it continued for a longer stretch of time, even the post-Vijayanagar period, Nayakas, Mysore Odiyars. So all along, the regional language, you know, they also patronized, they wrote a lot of inscriptions in Sanskrit, especially the copper clay charters. Yes, they did write in Kannada also, but even the Sanskrit continued in a pan-Indian pan context, I'm telling. And I emphasize, Brahmi was a pan-Indian script and Sanskrit was a pan-Indian language, which you find continued throughout for a longer stretch of time. So in the beginning of uh, end of 6th century or 7th century in India, South Indian context, we see the emergence of uh, the languages, regional languages, Canada, Telugu and uh, many other languages. And uh, it continued, Telugu, many, uh, even Malayalam, the language which belongs to a much later period of 14th century common era. So. Uh, the script, you know, also started Canada. We have Halimidi inscription and uh, many more inscription that is 6th, 7th century onwards. But we have, uh, we may note that there are Nagari inscriptions, especially uh, from the South Canada belt, you know, they are in Nagari, but the language is Canada. Just a very interesting thing. And uh, we have such inscriptions. So this in brief, uh, I'm telling about the language and script it's very, very important. Uh, one should try to understand. And then, as you know, the huge, large number of inscriptions are from 
are lithic and copper plate inscriptions. And uh, you have a large number of copper plate also. There are certain dynasties like Maitaka Savalabi, Gahadwalas, and all, you know, where we have to de depend purely on their copper plate charters to uh, de develop their genealogy or their political conquests or their contribution. So we solely depend on the copper plate charters of certain dynasties. And uh, the types of inscriptions, see, as I told you, depending on the contents of the inscription, the scholars, you know, they classify as a Dana Shasana, Kraya Shasana, the most of them of donatory nature. So the Kraya Shasana, Vijaya Shasana, these are the different uh, classification based on the contents of the inscription. And then we have a separate category like hero stones, which are found in large number in Karnataka and uh, even other, and uh, Sati, Sati stones. So scholars have tried to classify them on based on the contents of the inscription. And uh, you have Yupa also stone, they have classified like this. And uh, inscriptions are found not only in copper or stone, we have on other materials like brick, there are brick inscriptions, which are mostly used when they made an altar to make uh, sacrificial uh, sacrifice, you know, they used, like we have referenced Ashwamedha, Poundarika, so many uh, sacrifices that are recorded or written on the brick. And uh, then we have a rare instance, of course, of a wooden inscription from Kirari. It is a wooden post because since it was deeply rooted in a seabed or a river bed, it didn't get destroyed, but it's a very, very important uh, inscription uh, on wood, which is still preserved in Nagpur Museum. And we have on Kanch, like Shalihundam, you know, we have inscription on Kanch written and on Bell. So I mean to say on silver and gold, we have other than the copper plate, other than the copper or stone, we have inscriptions are written on different metal. Uh, uh, and uh, apart from this, I want to mention the archaeological sites and epigraphy material. You know, a large number of excavations, apart from archaeological objects, they have also yielded number of inscriptions, maybe in fragmentary nature, pedestal inscriptions, or maybe on a part shared with some Brahmi letter, and apart from the epigraphic material, large number of coins that has come through in hordes or stray, that is another very important aspect an archeologist has to see during the course of excavation, he gets a larger number of coins also, and then seals and sealings. So these are the material who an archeologist also need the knowledge of the script and the language. It's, uh, we can't, because I said, you know, earlier, archaeology and epigraphy, they go together. We can't see it in isolation. Whenever an archaeologist material gets some inscribed material, maybe copper plate uh, also, at least in the primer phase, I feel that he should be able to say to which, which is the script, which period it belongs to, the language. So that basic knowledge, even an archaeologist also is required, not only the techniques of excavation and other objects, terracotta objects, so many things, but in the historic side, when you come across many material, epigraphy, engraved material, other than the inscription, then the knowledge, even a numismatist know, should know the script, the language it is written. So I'm emphasizing again and again, the knowledge of the script is a highly essential, irrespective of the discipline. Of course, for a final say or final opinion, he can pass it on to an epigraphist for his final view. But I insist upon the younger students of archaeology and others. Now, apart from learning the technique principles of archaeology and uh, 
this one they should also try to know the script here it's very very essential uh, for an archaeologist to uh, the knowledge of uh, the scripts so i too had occasion to participate a number of excavations udayagiri and made in situ study of many of the inscriptions the one of the important being the ayodhya also which was the last one uh, unfortunately no clinching evidence could in that but we are banking on the again uh, the efforts by other scholars who could decipher the earlier inscription that's how a major decision also could come through the supreme court in uh, the way of our uh, uh, ram janmabhoomi issue also so epigraphy played a very very important role when archaeology the epigraphy they go hand in hand unfortunately now you know we try to demarcate it those who know archaeology they did not do they also know uh, some principles of archaeology also some knowledge of script and is very very essential for the student uh, to decipher the seal sensing again along with the coins you know we have large number of seals though not much from south even the, there are large number of seals and professor taplial has done a pioneering work in his book has written seals and sealing he has dealt exhaustively and how even it also forms a primary source what are the primary source epigra archaeology epigraphy numismatic the study of coins and seals and sealing and other they also form the primary source to understand our ancient indian history and especially for uh, video edo vandad nindad Hello. Ah, so there is. Uh, I would some technical snag. I would like to continue. So I was telling about the archaeological sites and the epigraph material. Uh, the knowledge of script is highly essential, and the knowledge of calligraphy is essential as a tool in understanding date and inscription. You know. in epigraphs you know we have dated inscriptions and sometimes undated inscription some inscriptions of fragmentary nature which we are unable to so here calligraphy comes in a major way to understand to which century the inscription belongs so by seeing though not though not dated we can see we can assign to gupta period 6th century 7th century or 8th century depending on the characters so this is very very important uh, thing along with the other uh, in the stratified level we get some archaeological material calligraphy also comes handy to date the inscription next time i am going to come to the format of the inscription is very very important you know they and usually the inscription begins with uh, invocatory words followed by sometime the date portion and next subsequently we have the invocations and the followed by the genealogy of the kings and other details 
and then the object of the inscription is recorded and if it is a copper plate inscription we have imprecate reverse also recorded and then it ends so this in general the format it depends on the length of the inscription and three persons are involved one is the composer of the inscription another is the writer who writes and the engraver so three persons are involved when uh, long inscriptions are cut or prepared and uh, the activities of the archaeological survey of india and the epigraphy branch also i want to make a brief mention as a uh, you know the archaeological survey of india was established in 1861 perhaps one of the premier organization come into existence was the epigraphy branch in the year 1887 with e hulsh a german scholar as the first government epigraphist and um, you know the office of the epigraphist directorate epigraphy has a huge collection of stamp pages copied from throughout india which runs to several more than 75000 stamp pages are stored and a large number of scholars also they do visit to as examine the stamp page or the inscription the transcripts and the annual reports so this is very important and uh, the sometime you know it becomes only the source material now the if you visit to that place you know the stone may not be there or the particular inscription may not be available but whatever earlier scholars or epigraphists they have copied and preserved in the office of the director of epigraphy the only source and uh, most of the students have observed they go for the secondary sources to write their research work and i insist here and request that if needed no they should uh, consult the original stamp page or the transcript prepared or uh, preserved in the directory epigraphy so it's a very rich treasure house of stamp pages even the directorate of archaeology and museums have but the in a lot of epigraphical survey that conducted in subsequent years we have a large number of inscriptions that is the mysore office uh, with its head uh, as sanskrit and dravidian inscriptions we have another branch at nagpur for arabic and persian inscriptions so the, we have a large number of inscription copied from all over india and have uh, been documented in the annual report on indian epigraphy and subsequently in the year 1990 two zonal offices were established one at earlier jhansi now presently functioning from lucknow another at chennai they have also been conducting and copying new inscriptions from different parts of india uh, this uh, very very important so epigraphy as i told forms a primary source in fact to construct early or ancient in industry without epigraph it is not possible and uh, earlier prior to independence the epigraphists and scholars you know they focused on to build a connected political history maybe gupta or maitrakas any history now now the trend is to look into the cultural aspects like social history economic history and many other aspects that are hidden in the epigraphs that need to be brought to light so more stress is uh, being laid now to bring out the cultural value of the history that is preserved in the epigraphs and uh, awareness and training is a very important aspect we have to create a large awareness program and uh, the government of india and the archaeological survey and the different branches you know they have been doing to create uh, awareness among the public among the students to sensitize the students and public how to preserve our uh, cultural heritage this is a very very important thing and uh, we have been doing it and still a large in the awareness has to go in a larger measure 
to emphasize the importance of our the records and uh, to create a second and third line of scholars there is a need to have refresher courses a workshop on epigraphy and calligraphy so that there are a large number of unedited inscriptions whatever you know earlier written by scholars they are there but the still large number of inscriptions are there to be edited and brought to so that we can enlarge the work you know historical work whatever we have we can authenticate it give a lot of material for the researchers so still a large number of inscriptions which are to be deciphered already deciphered we have to take a relook and restudy them to get a connected history and uh, the heritage you know we have a large heritage with it may be archaeological heritage sculptural heritage architectural even epigraphy forms one of the important uh, heritage see we can when you go to a temple maybe in a corner you know have some inscription recorded but they have do importance unfortunately now we are losing sight of it we are not looking into those inscriptions and we just take a look around and come back so i insist when you visit any temple any archaeological site or any monument please look into the epigraphs and uh, which throw much light on that and we did a lot of uh, photography exhibitions and now earlier you know they were uh, only focusing on the inscription alone now they were trying to situate we are trying to locate those inscriptions along with the monument so that uh, we can understand so this a very very important uh, message i'm giving so please look into those aspects we have india is a vast country with a lot of heritage in fact those countries with lesser you know they are giving uh, lesser I mean more value a place like malhar has large number of uh, ruins you know uh, epigraph material they need to be recorded they need to be studied so we have to give do importance to preservation conservation of our heritage whether it may be archaeological heritage sculpture epigraph or any other thing so with this uh, message preservation and uh, this one have broadly touched upon the entire gamut of the epigraphical studies uh, from the beginning to the end. and thank you very much thank you sir thank you ache chaya ஒன்றுக்குஷன் no it is uh, though it's a different way of writing this is sarkar and other scholars you know they have placed it to 3rd century bc it is not taken earlier to that but uh, it has some special features so it is not earlier than 3rd century bc as on the many scholars are they have accepted it and uh, placed it to 3rd century bc batiprolu inscription 